Alfremer Foundation by Robert Keene in 1787. Talk about long pastorates. John Rippon pastored, uh, pastored the Carter's Lane Baptist Church in London for 63 years, beginning in 1775. He was born in 1751, so he was in his mid-twenties when he first mounted the Carter Lane's pulpit following his education at the Baptist College in Bristol, England. During the years at Carter's Lane, John developed a vision for a church hymnal, which he edited assisted by his minister of music, Robert Keane. The resulting volume, a selection of hymns from the best authors in, intended to be an appendix to Dr. Watts' Psalms and Hymns was published in 1787. It was a runaway hit, especially among the Baptists, going through 11 British editions during Ripon's life, lifetime. An American edition appeared in 1820. How from a foundation, first appeared here. No one knows its author, for the line reserved for the author's name simply bore the letter K. Many scholars attribute the composition to Keene. The unique power of this hymn is due to the fact that each of the seven original stanzas was based on various biblical promises. The first verse established the hymnist's theme, God's word is a sufficient foundation for our faith. The author then selected precious promises from the Bible and converted these into hymn stanzas. Among them, Isaiah 41.10, Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you, yes, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Isaiah 43.2, When you pass through the waters, I will be with you, and through the rivers, they shall not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, nor shall the flames scorch you. 2 Corinthians 12.9, my grace is sufficient for you. My strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of God <clears throat> may rest upon me. And Hebrews 13, 5. For he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. No wonder this hymn was first published under the title, Exceedingly Great and Precious Promises. So we're going to sing How Firm a Foundation Now. If you folks would like to stand, we'll stand for this first song. <clears throat> All from a foundation, ye saints of the Lord, is laid for your faith in his excellent word. What more can he say than to you he has said, you who unto Jesus for refuge have fled? Fear not, I am with thee, O oh, be not dismayed, I, I am thy God, I will... Give the aid, all strength on the hell, the and cause thee to stand upheld by my grace, just a nip but on hand. The soul that on Jesus hath leaned for ripples, I will not, I will not desert to his foes, but so though all hell should endeavor to shake, I'll never, no, never, no, never forsake. Has somebody said something? Oh, was it on a different? Okay. <clears throat> Uh, we're going to have an opening prayer at this time. My son's going to fill in for the person that's not here. Please pray with me. And dear Lord, we thank you for everything you've given us and done for us. And we come to you with 
prayers and praises. Uh, we praise you that you have allowed the Supreme Court to allow coaches to play with their teams. And pray for, we thank you for Beta Lipton's new grandchild, Micah. And we pray for her daughter, Lisa, who has COVID. Um, pray that you heal her. We pray for um, a man named Perry, who left calf appears to be torn off. We pray to heal his left calf. And we pray for Maggie Kendall, for her husband who passed away, that you help her um, find peace and find uh, and just remember the good times with them. Uh, you pray for Beverly Tedrick to help him, uh, her get well, and for Daryl Anderson for his recovery from plastic surgery. And we praise you for Tony Edgar, who just recently got baptized. We thank you so much for your son, who died on the cross for our sins, and we pray in his name, amen. Yep, Karen said I should <clears throat> follow the monitors of the book. I thought, and this is kind of really funny, I was really persnickety about making sure that the monitor matched the book exactly, but my edition of this book at home is edition 2000, and this is edition uh, 2003. So in those three years, some of the songs, they changed the verses slightly. So even though I was so careful about making, I'm going to make it perfect, I made it perfect with the wrong book. <laughs> so I'll, I'll make sure and <clears throat> use the monitor when I'm leading it. That way we're all singing the same verses. Oh, well. <clears throat> Before the Lord's Supper, we're going to um, sing, Alas, Did My Savior Bleed? <clears throat> and I want to read to you a little bit about the author of this song. But God forbid that I should boast except in the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ, Galatians 6.14. After his graduation from college, Isaac Watts returned to Southampton, England, and spent two years writing hymns for Above Bar Congregational Church. He then moved to London to tutor children and a wealthy family of dissenters. While there, he joined Mark Lane Independent Chapel. Soon he was asked to be a teacher in the church, and in 1698, he was hired as associate pastor. There, on his 24th birthday, he preached his first sermon. In 1702, he became senior pastor of the church, a position he retained the rest of his life. He was a brilliant Bible student, and his sermons brought the church to life. In 1707, his hymns and spiritual songs was published. Isaac had written most of these hymns in Southampton in his late teens and early 20s. Including, included was a hymn now considered the finest hymn ever written in the English language. It was based on Galatians 6.14. But God forbid that I should boast, except on the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Originally, the first stanza said, When I survey the wondrous cross where the young prince of glory died. And in large 1709 edition, Watts rewrote the lines to say, When I survey the wondrous cross on which the prince of glory died, my richest gain I count but loss and poor content on all my pride. This hymn played a major role in the conversion of a great hymnist. In 1851, Fanny Crosby, at the time 31, attended a revival service at John Street Methodist Church in New York. After prayer was offered, she recalled, they began to sing that grand old consecration hymn, Alas, and Did My Savior Bleed. And when they reached the third line of the fifth stanza, Here, Lord, I give myself away. My very soul was flooded with celestial light. How appropriate that Watts should long after his death Pay a part in the winning to Christ, the author of a new generation of hymns and gospel songs. So we're going to sing, uh, Alas, Did My Savior Bleed? And then uh, we will have our um, Lord's Supper. <clears throat> Alas, and did my Savior bleed? And did my soul and die. Would he devote that sacred head for sinners such as I? 
Was it for crime that I have done? He groaned upon the tree. Amazing pity, grace unknown, and love beyond degree. Well might the sun in darkness hide and shut his glories in. When God the mighty maker died for man the creature's sin. But drops of grief can ne'er repay the debt of love I owe. Here, Lord, I give myself away. Tis all that I can do. Church. Oh, thank you. It's my assistant. She's always my handler. <laughs> yeah, my brain. Oh, thank you. Yes. Well, now that's going to go to her head. So. So. <laughs> so, welcome everybody. It's good. Good to see everybody here, and appreciate what Steve's doing with uh, giving this history of songs, because I always wonder where these inspirations come from, and uh, I think that's good good information to have. Uh, this morning, I'm going to read um, from Acts chapter 2, verse 20, 42, and it says, they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teachings and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. And then if we go down to, let's see, 1 Corinthians eleven twenty eight, 28, it says, but a man must examine himself, and in so doing, he is to eat of the bread and drink of the cup. So as we, as part of our fellowship, uh, we come together to remember our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And at this time, we're going to remember um, the sacrifice of, that was made. And it says for us to examine ourselves and then to do that. So as we examine ourselves, let's go to our Father in prayer. Dear God, we come to you this morning um, uh, to give thanks and to remember the uh, necessary sacrifice that was made on our behalf uh, for the uh, life of Christ who uh, came here to willingly present himself as a sacrifice for our sins. We ask you uh, to guide our hearts and our minds as we examine ourselves and remember the, the, the sacrifice that was made for us. Uh, we ask you to bless this bread, which represents his body. In Christ's name, amen.
tricky. <laughs> no, you're okay. Success. So now let's give uh, thanks for the uh, fruit of the vine. Um, dear Father, we come to you this morning uh, to remember Christ and the blood that he shed on the cross for the sins of all mankind. Help us to understand this meaning for our personal lives and how we can apply his teachings so that we can live a life that uh, is uh, glorifies his name. And we pray this in Christ's name. Yeah, that would be a <clears throat> useful upgrade for our communion cups if they had a little pull tab on there. So that'd be easy to grab that from because it took me a while to learn how to do it. Once I learned how to do it, it became pretty easy, but it can really trick you up the first time. You know, that's, uh, my memory is about as long as my nose. And uh, when I put this together, I thought, man, I'm going to fool everybody by having a last and did my Savior bleed with just the... Uh, lines, but that's the way it was really originally written. I thought, oh, we'll do it that way anyway, and then I forgot that I did it that way, but oh well. <clears throat> that's okay. Um, we're going to sing, This Is My Father's World. This is one of my uh, favorite songs, and I want to uh, uh, tell you about the person that wrote this right quick, and then we'll uh, sing it. Um, Maltby Babcock author of this My Father's World, was born in Sierra Cruz, New York, into a socially prominent family. He was educated at Sierra Cruz University and Auburn Theology Seminary. In the school, he was a great athlete, an actor, and a musician. After ordination as a Presbyterian minister, he was called to the Presbyterian Church in Lockport, New York. In 1886, he became pastor of the prestigious Brown Memorial Church in Baltimore. After almost 14 years, Babcock left Brown Memorial to fill a vacancy at the Brick Presbyterian Church in New York City, created by the retirement of the noted Henry Van Dyke. Matt B. Babcock's great career was cut short in 1901. Just 18 months after becoming pastor of the Brick Presbyterian Church, as he and his wife were returning from a visit to the Holy Land, Matt B. Babcock died. Most of his hymns were published after his death, included including the most beloved hymn, This Is My Father's World. Franklin Shepard was an accomplished teacher and director of music. He edited and published a hymnal called Alleluia. It was in this songbook that many of Babcock's songs were published, including This Is My Father's World. One of the reasons that so many of our songs were written by pastors during the uh, 16, 17, and 1800s is that um, they didn't have songbooks back then. And often, um, but, and this is also why they had choirs, is often the uh, pastor would write a song or some songs that would go with his sermon. Then he would go, uh, uh, bring in a group of singers, and they would practice the songs, and then that would become part of the service. So that's why we have so many songs that are written by pastors from that time period, and almost none written now because everybody sings from songbooks and nobody has the motivation to write their own songs anymore. We're going to sing, uh, This Is My Father's World, and after we sing this song, just out of tradition, uh, uh, we don't need to change things, we're going to stand up, meet and greet each other for a few minutes, and then we'll go on with our service. So if you want to stand, we'll sing 991, This Is My Father's World. <clears throat> this is my father's world, and to my listening ears. All nature sings and round me rings The music of the spheres This is my Father's world I rest me in the thought Of rocks and 
and trees, the skies and seas, His hand the wonders wrought. This is my Father's world, the buds, the carols raise, the morning light, the lily white, declare their Maker's praise. This is my Father's world, He shines in all that's fair. In the rustling grass I hear him pass, He speaks to me everywhere. This is my Father's world, Oh, let me now forget, that though the wrong seems all so strong, God is the ruler yet. This is my Father's world, the battle is not done. Jesus, who died, shall be satisfied, and earth and heaven be won. I'll hail the power of Jesus' name. <clears throat> Who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God, angel and authorities and powers having been made subject to him? 1 Peter 3.22. In November 1799, issue of the Gospel Magazine, edited by Augustus Toplady, there appeared an anonymous hymn entitled, on the resurrection and the Lord is King. All hail the power of Jesus' name, let angels prostrate fall. Bring forth the royal diadem and crown him Lord of all. The author, it was later revealed, was Reverend Edward Coronet. Edward's Protestant grandparents had fled Catholic France, going first to Switzerland, then to England. Edward's father had become a vicar in the Anglican church and Edward followed in his footsteps. For, se for several years, he became closely allied with the Wesleys, traveling with them and sometimes caught up in their adventures. In John Wesley's journal, we find this entry. Edward Perronet was thrown down and rolled in the mud and mire, and stones were hurled and windows broken. In, ha in time, however, Edward broke with the Wesleys over various Methodist policies and John Wesley excluded his hymns from the Methodist hymnals. Edward went off to pasture a small independent church in Canterbury, where he died on January 22, 1792. His last words were, Glory to God in the height of his divinity, glory to God in the depth of his humanity, glory to God in his all-sufficiency, into his hands I commit my spirit. Edward pronounced him, All hail the power, has earned him an indelible place in the history of church music. It also has a place in missionary history, being greatly used in evangelistic endeavors. Reverend E.P. Scott, for example, missionary to India, wrote of trying to reach a savage tribe in the Indian subcontinent. Ignoring the pleadings of his friends, he set off into the dangerous territory. Several days later, he made a large party of warriors who surrounded him, their spears pointed to his heart. Expecting to die at any moment, Scott took out his violin, breathed a prayer, closed his eyes, and began singing, All hail the power of Jesus' name. When he reached the words that every kindred and every tribe, he opened his eyes, and there stood the warriors, some in tears, every spear lowered. Scott spent the next two years evangelizing the tribe. So there's a little story behind that song. So we're now going to sing, All Hail the Power of Jesus' Name. I sing from the monitor, but this is my security blanket. <clears throat> All oh, hail the power of Jesus' name, let angels prostrate fall. Bring forth the royal diadem, uncrown him, Lord of all. Bring forth the royal diadem. 
diadem and crown him Lord of all. Ye chosen seed of Israel's race, ye ransom from the fall. Hail him who saves you by his grace and crown him Lord of all. Hail him who saves you by his grace and crown him Lord of all. Let every kindred, every tribe on this terrestrial ball to him all majesty ascribe and crown him Lord of all. To him all majesty ascribe and crown him Lord of all. Oh, that with yonder sacred throng we at his feet may fall. We'll join the everlasting song and crown him Lord of all. We'll join the everlasting song and crown him Lord of all. All right, our next song is In Heavenly Love Abiding. That would be song number 139. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and of good courage. Do not be afraid or dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Joshua 9, verse 1. One of our most reassuring hymns is Anna Waring's In Heavenly Love Abiding. Anna was born in a Quaker family in Wales in 1823. As a teen, she joined the Church of England and was baptized in 1842. She was a lifelong student of the Hebrew language and daily read from the Book of Psalms in the original text. And a special burden was for those behind bars. And she devoted herself to prison ministry and to causes like the Discharged Prisoners Aid Society. In 1850, she published a little volume of 19 hymns. Among them was this one, In Heavenly Love Abiding, which Anna called Safety in God. Here's another lesser known Anna Waring's hymn based on Psalms 31:15. My times are in your hand. Father, I know that all my life is portioned out for me, and the changes that are sure to come I do not fear to see. But I ask this, but I ask for a, a present mind intent on pleasing thee. I ask thee for a thoughtful love, though constant watching wise, to meet the glad and joyful smiles and to wipe the weeping eyes, and a heart at, le and a heart at leisure from itself to soothe and sympathize. I would not have the restless will that hurries to and fro, seeking for some great thing to do, a secret thing to know. I would be treated as a child and guided where to go. Wherever in the world I am, to whatsoever estate, I have a fellowship with hearts to keep and cultivate, and a work of lowly love to do for the Lord on whom I wait. So I ask thee for the daily strength to none that ask denied, and a mind to blend with outward life while keeping at thy side, content to fill a little space if thou be glorified. So we're going to sing the song she wrote in Heavenly Love Abiding. <clears throat> In heavenly love abiding, no change my heart shall fear, and safe is such confiding, for nothing changes here. 
The storm may roar without me, my heart may low be laid, but God is round about me, and can I be dismayed? Wherever he may guide me, no one shall turn me back. My shepherd is beside me, and nothing can I lack. His wisdom ever waketh, his sight is never dim. He knows the way he taketh, and I will walk with him. Green pastures are before me, which yet I have not seen. Bright skies will soon be o'er me, where darkest clouds have been. My hope I cannot measure, my path to life is free. My Savior has my treasure, and he will walk with me. Our next song we're going to um, read about and sing is What a Friend We Have in Jesus. That's song number 800 in your book. Joseph Scriven watched in shock as the body of his fiancée was pulled from the lake. Their wedding had been planned for the next day. Joseph Scriven was born in St. Patrick County, Down, Ireland, and graduated from Trinity College at Dublin in 1842. Tragedy struck Joseph on the day before his wedding when his bride accidentally drowned. Distraught, he moved to Canada when 25 years old. In Canada, he taught school in Woodstock, Brantford, and served as tutor to the family of Lieutenant Pengali near uh, Rudedli. Rude Joseph fell in love with a relative of Peng Pengali's, Miss Eliza Roche. Then, tra then tragedy struck again. A short, a short time before their wedding, Eliza became ill and died. Joseph quit teaching, and as a member of the Plymouth Brethren, devoted most of his time to doing menial work for the aged, accepting no payment in return. He lived out his years alone in a little white cottage in Port Hope, Canada, where in 1855 he wrote, what a friend we have in Jesus for his mother in Ireland. It's amazing how people with the most tragic lives can write some of the most beautiful songs. Yeah. <laughs> Bad luck. <laughs> no. <laughs> no kidding. <clears throat> okay. What a friend we have in Jesus, all our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. All oh, because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. Have we trials and temptation? Is there trouble anywhere? We should never be discouraged. Take it to the Lord in prayer. That Christ may dwell in your hearts and through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and length, depth and height, 
to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Ephesians 3, 17 through 19. Anna and Susan Warner lived in a lovely townhouse in New York City where their father, Henry Whitting Warner, was a, a successful lawyer. But the panic of 1837 wrecked the family's finances, forcing them to move into a ramshackle revolutionary war era home on Constitution Island on the Hudson, right across from the military academy at West Point. Needing to contribute to the family income, Anna and Susan began writing poems and stories for publication. Anna wrote Robinson Crusoe's Farmland, and Susan wrote The Wide, Wide World. The girls thus launched parallel literary careers, which resulted in 106 publications, 18 of them co-authored. One of their most successful joint projects was a novel titled Say and Seal, in which a little boy named John Fox is dying. His Sunday school teacher, John Linden, comforts him by taking him in his arms, rocking him, and making up a little song. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. The novel became a bestseller, second only to Uncle Tom's Cabin. And when him writer William Bradbury read the words of John Little's little song written by Anna, he composed a childlike musical score to go along with them. Jesus Loves Me soon became the best-known children's hymn on earth. Despite their successes, Anna and Susan never seemed able to recover from the financial setback of 1836. Years later, a friend wrote, one day when sitting with Miss Anna in the old living room, she took from one of the cases a little shell, so delicate that it looked like lace work. Holding it in her hand, with, dimmed, with eyes dimmed with tears, she said, there was a time when I was very perplexed. Bills were unpaid, necessities must be had, and somebody sent me this exquisite thing. As I held it, I, re I realized that if God could make this beautiful home for a little creature, he could take care of me. Forty years, Susan and Anna conducted Bible classes for cadets at West Point, and both of them are buried with full military honors. They are the only civilians buried in the military cemetery at West Point. To this day, their home on Constitution Island is maintained by West Point as a museum to their memory. So, I bet you didn't know that about Jesus Loves Me. So we're going to sing that song now. I bet you for the first verse, we probably don't even need the book. <laughs> <clears throat> Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. Jesus loves me, he who died. Heaven's gates to open wide. He will wash away my sin. Let his little child come in. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. Jesus, take this heart of mine. Make it pure and holy thine. On the cross you died for me. I will try to live for thee. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. For our final song we're going to do is Have Thine Own Way, and it's also going to be an a invitation song. And if you have any prayer requests, uh, you can bring them up here. And uh, 
How about, uh, Curtis, you collect those if you would, okay? And um, if you'll um, stand for the, well, I'll, I'll read you the uh, um, story behind the song, and then when we get ready to sing the song, we'll stand for the song. <clears throat> and that'll be if you want to mark it in your book, song 552. As the clay is in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand. Jeremiah 18, verse 6. Hope deferred makes the heart sick, says Proverbs 13, 12. Yet disappointments are his appointment. God uses setbacks to renew our focus on him, to strengthen our faith, to divert us to other opportunities. In this case, a bitter disappointment led to one of our greatest invitational hymns. Its author, Adelaide Pollard, was born in Iowa during the Civil War. Her parents named her Sarah, but when she was old enough, she changed her name to Adelaide, not liking the name Sarah. After attending the Boston School of Oratory, or Emerson College, she moved to Chicago to teach in a girls' school. While she was in Chicago, she was involved with an international faith healer. The story is that she was healed of diabetes. The faith healer started a large cult that predicted the imminent return of Christ. This endeavor eventually failed, and Adelaide moved to New England, where she was involved with the work of another evangelist that was predicting the imminent return of Christ. It is easy for us to laugh at this, but the Apostle Paul lived and taught as if the Lord would come back at any moment. But when the Apostle warns us, but then the Apostle warns us. In the book he wrote to Titus that we must, we must keep working and living for God as we wait for his return and not to sit idly by waiting for the Lord's coming. Adelaide obviously had a passion for the Lord and this led her to become a missionary to Africa. She went through many disappointments attempting to raise funds for her mission. Heartsick Adelaide in, in her 40s at the time attended a prayer meeting. That night an elderly woman prayed it doesn't matter what you bring into our lives. Lord, just have your own way with us. That phrase rushed into Adelaide's heart, and the verses began shaping in her mind. At home that evening, she read again the story of the potter and the clay in Jeremiah 18. By bedtime, she had written out the prayer, Have thine own way. Adelaide did eventually make it to Africa, but World War I interfered with that plan also. She spent the rest of her life in America writing poems, and speaking at group engage engagements. So we'll sing, if, if you'd like to stand, we'll sing, Have Thine Own Way, Lord. And uh, you can give your uh, prayer request to Curtis, and then we'll have a closing prayer. <clears throat> have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way. Thou art the potter, I am the clay. Mold me and make me after thy will. While I am waiting, yielded and still. Have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way. Search me and try me, Master, today. Whiter than snow, Lord, wash me just now. As in thy presence, humbly I bow. Have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way. Hold o'er my being, absolute sway. Fill with thy spirit, till all shall see. Christ only always living in me.